where we usually start our speaker. Today, we're going to do a roundtable discussion. And the roundtable discussion will be uh, based on uh, packaging systems such as uh, Snap, App Image, and Flatpak. Uh, I actually gave a presentation on this a number of years ago, but I'm not an expert and I don't use those packages. Um, we did have one time a guy from uh, Canonical signed up to come to the meeting, but he never showed up. There's yeah, a recent was... video from DistroTube about uh, what he thinks of the different um, portable app package formats. And I'm going to, as soon as I find it, I'm going to drop the link in the chat Yeah. to be watched later, of course. But yeah. if anybody wants it. I look at it in two ways. One way is if you look at it from a developer standpoint, uh, I've discussed this with um, the developer of... Uh, 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 Photox and uh, but from a developer standpoint you can put stuff together and then you can and that will probably work in most Linux distributions uh, but there's a downside of them First of all, it's extra work for, well, it's not extra work, but it's, uh, you know, you've got to put all the libraries together and stuff like that. So. And there's some other uh, downsides I'll talk about. I think Jill is not, Dick and Jill aren't here. Jill, uh, Miller had a problem with uh, Thunderbird. And I will talk about her uh, situation later because I understand it. Thanks, Brendan. Yep. And obviously that video is opinionating, but uh, opinionated. Yeah. But uh, it, it's interesting if, uh, if you are into this topic. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as a user, it just adds another bit of complexity. You know, Ubuntu users, you know, just want to use um, app get or synopsis as their as their uh, package manager. And of course, Fedora users like me want to use DNF or uh, the GNOME uh, package manager to install as, packages. As, as an occasional software publisher, I can completely understand the issue, especially if you're not being paid for it. The, yeah. I, I just want to put out a package that will work on the most number of computers possible without yep. having to worry about supporting everyone installing it. Exactly. And, and as a user, I, that's okay. As long if I really want the app and it's not in all the repos because it's new, then I'll take it. Especially when you're talking about like some browsers that take, you know, three hours and uh, a college degree to figure out how to compile. Yeah. I, You know, my background is more into uh, compilers and libraries and working for big companies like uh, DEC and Red Hat and IBM. But, uh, yeah, we had a product when I worked for Algorithmics that was really very difficult to install and I actually had to write a uh, script to install it. Originally it was written in bash. Bash really, so many different options and stuff like that, that bash wasn't really uh, appropriate for that. So I didn't tickle TK, but I had to do uh, 
a bit of multitasking in there because some parts of the project actually had to be spun into separate processes or threads. I ended up doing it in uh, Python with uh, TK Enter. And uh, then I converted it to, uh, I, I think it was GTK. I don't really uh, remember, but it was uh, TK Enter was had the same graphical commands as uh, Tickle TK. So well, they, they took Tickle TK and they put it into Python and then yes. put a, a Python library around it. And yep. the wonderful thing about that was that it was the same library core feature of Python on every system that had Python. Yes. So you could write a few lines of code and have a dialog box. That's correct. And so then I uh, converted it and it uh, worked pretty well. And then the whole project I was on actually got canceled because we only really had about four companies. They were very wealthy companies like Prudential, some of the big insurance companies. And the product we had was written in Java and the company that actually wrote it was in the Netherlands and their name was second floor. <laughs> and the main developer we worked with was Italian. <clears throat> so I still communicate with the Italian guy through Facebook. Oh, by the way, Jerry, did, if I write in the chat, does that appear in the YouTube recording? Nope. No. Okay. I was talking about a video by DistroTube, and it's uh, you can keep your snaps and flat packs. I'll take app images. Yeah, so it, there, it's been recorded. I always save yeah, the chat and post on the blue website, so it'll be okay. the full reference. Yeah. The yeah, chat's always saved if Jabba remembers to. Oh, I always get to it eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. It's like an old joke about the uh, 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 guy complaining about his wife saying, uh, I told you, uh, I said, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. You don't have to keep uh, reminding me every six months. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of getting to it, uh, are we going to see the last couple of uh, presentations on YouTube, or is that no longer happening anymore? I'll be getting to it at some point. I just uh, I have a problem with procrastination, I guess. So. I've got two presentation recordings that I did in another club like three years ago now, and I haven't cut them and sent them to the YouTube guy yet. <laughs> yeah. But we, um, you know, after I record them, I download them to a shared uh, Dropbox. And uh, there, Jabber can pick them up. And when I know he's he's got them and copied, we can delete them where he deletes them. So some of them are still in uh, YouTube. And I believe there's one that... Uh, Federico didn't want us to publish until no, after, yeah. after he made the talk. So actually, I already prepared that one. I just haven't made it public yet. Yeah. So the scale meeting doesn't get uh, get postponed again. We'll we do that uh, probably August first. Yeah. Last so, week of July. It was it was originally April because the uh, scale meeting was supposed to be in March, but then it got postponed to July. 
but he didn't want us supposed to until after he gave the presentation at that meeting. So, John, uh, I think your indirect source is here, Chris Allen. Hi, Chris. Hey, how's it going? We're talking about uh, package managers? Yeah. Are we also going to talk about uh, politics and religion? We can if you want. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, Emacs e versus Vim. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, Chris and I go back uh, quite a while. And uh, more recently, uh, we both worked together in the same building. I worked for Algorithmics, and Chris worked for another company, but we our desks were a little bit apart. That's when after IBM bought Algorithmics, and then IBM bought his company. And then Chris left and went to uh, Washington. Yeah, actually, I, I just got an offer earlier today for uh, the Oregon State University uh, Open Source Lab. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So looking forward to that. <laughs> Yeah, Kurt says it's a good lab. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I'll be working for as uh, uh, Lance uh, Robertson. Got a curious question to ask that's not really Linux, but just curious, uh, do you have a lot of attendance on your live stream as opposed to coming into uh, Jitsi? Uh, it's usually not a lot. Um, I don't really look at it that closely, but it's only uh, just a few. Yeah, I think there's no, for most people, there's no need because the Jitsi is, is free and they can uh, come in and they can talk there in real time. But uh, I don't know. Uh, the main reason we do the uh, live streaming is because uh, we want to get the video on, on YouTube uh, for uh, future yeah. reference. And our yeah. I mean, used to be able to do it on a camcorder, and it would take me months to get that uploaded. So the the live stream, it's already on YouTube by the time the meeting's over. Okay, okay. so you're not doing a, a recording like a Zoom recording and then having to post it up. Jitsi oh, plugs it, into yeah. YouTube. So the live stream is a Zoom recording. It's using YouTube as a recording service, right? Yeah. yeah. And do you take it off YouTube and then cut it, or what's recorded is the video? Yeah, I didn't download the raw video off of YouTube, but, or actually Jerry does that once it's ready. Yeah, he's the one it. And I trim it out to the uh, the start of the presentation. I, I remove everything before that. And, yep. Uh, and I post that. And talking about the YouTube live stream chat, I hate that program. It, it's a coding horror. Like I, I have an expensive, probably $2,000 laptop for my company, maybe $3,000, really hefty and resourceful. And it slows down my browser when if I don't block the YouTube text chat. <laughs> and in, in most channels, there isn't much useful in stuff in the YouTube text chat. You just see whatever the presenter is responding to, that's the information. Somebody's got a lot of background noise.
Okay, well, it's 7 o'clock, and I'm just reading what John is reading. I just copy and paste that from the web page that I posted earlier. <laughs> Okay. It's the last word in the Amex versus VI wars. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I've been in, I was an Amex person for a long, long time. Used to be a guy that used to walk around our office with uh, Emax as God's editor. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, my daughter actually slugged, uh, uh, what's his name? RMS. Excuse me? RMS. RMS, yeah. My daughter used to work as a waitress in a uh, restaurant in Kendall Square. He used to come in all the time. She was a student at uh, Tufts at the time. Back in BCS days, I invited him to give a talk uh, one time, and he said he would never come to our meetings uh, unless yep. I changed the name of the uh, group from Boston Linux Unix to uh, GNU slash uh, Linux uh, group. And that was uh, a real big <laughs> Well, to be fair, if you compare the code size of GCC and Binutils, to the Linux yep. kernel, it, it's substantially larger. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's yeah. Linux wouldn't exist without all the commands and stuff that are available through GNU, and certainly, um, and we had a big discussion at our uh, board of directors meeting. Uh, the BLU when board of directors used to meet, which was a long time ago. Back, back in the 90s. And, uh, you know, I was a proponent for using GNU in the name, but uh, <clears throat> you, RMS was quite uh, religious about stuff, so. Another part of us, uh, be, my focus was basically Linux and Unix. So we'd have to talk to yes. Polaris and AAX and stuff like that. Exactly. If we, if we followed uh, RMS's dictate, we basically you know, would only talk about Linux and uh, have to ignore all the other Unixes that we were talking about. Yeah, and it's a lot of words, but I can understand him being defensive about all his work that, that his brand put into it. Yes. Yeah, the, part, the part I found uh, uh, really frustrating about it is I basically wanted him to give a talk on copyright and patent law. He had a lot yeah. of stuff to say about that, but he basically said the only thing that matters as far as he's concerned with respect to us is the name of the user group. <laughs> the such thing uh, basically trumps every other issue. Yep. Well, that, that's this, you're talking about the same person who will not pick and choose and adopt a personal computer unless he can pro program everything about it. And it, for years, he was using this little, uh, I think it was a ThinkPad, uh, or, but it was like a really little machine that didn't have a lot of power. But that was the one thing he could get that was portable and ran software the way he wanted to run it. I think it's more of a marketing problem than, than, than like an identification. It's just like, you know, you know, people really don't care about compilers. I think as long as their, you know, programs work. Yeah. That was the most fun I had was working in a compiler space. 
to be fair, most people don't care about um, OS kernels either. They just care about the three or four applications that they use on a daily basis. And if you don't have that for Linux, well, then I'm not interested. Yeah. No one cares that Linux is powering most of the computers in the world if you count servers and Android phones. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I think also, you know, if you ask any kind of everyday computer user, like if you ask them what Linux is, then they'll they'll conflate that with like say GNOME. They think like GNOME is Linux, whereas like <laughs> GNOME is a desktop on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> And no one would call Android Linux because all they see is the, is the, um, the graphical environment. Well, yeah. Well, they do. I mean, uh, you know, most people, when they get their first computers, uh, you know, they buy them, the Windows is installed and stuff like that, and they don't know anything else unless they you know, gone to school and stuff like that for it. Or they're in the industry. Whenever I get an Android phone, the first thing I put on is an SSH server so I can use R-Sync to back it up. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, to, so to, cool. yeah. I, I have an Android tablet with an EAG screen that I use for reading things. And the way that I copy books onto it is I have Caliber, the ebook collection program, running in a cloud server. And I connect over SSH, mount the Android's file system, and I sync my, I use Caliber commands to push the tablet over the internet over SSH because that's the most convenient way for me to do it. I have Caliber in, on my cloud server because I might be on any particular computer at any given moment, and Caliber doesn't like to have multiple hosts. So let's start a discussion on um, packaging. Uh, I was hoping that uh, Dick and Jill would be here, but uh, there are several packaging methods available on uh, computers, such as Snap, uh, Flatpak, and uh, App Image, that are that help developers put together software that can run on across different Linux platforms. <clears throat> um, I know that Flatpak and Snap are actually um, container-based or virtual machine-based. The problem that Jill had with Thunderbird is that Dick and Jill keep their data on a separate partition, which they call user data. And so all their, all everything from their home directory and everything else is there. But <clears throat> when uh, she started using Thunderbird in a snap, uh, she couldn't get to the user data and couldn't get it to share her old Thunderbird permissions and uh, saved mail and everything else. Jerry, can I interrupt you? Did they switch yes. the, those two systems you mentioned? Did they switch over to containers? Because last I heard, they had the binary application and its files were an overlay file system from an archive file. And the user files were mounted in a separate security context, but not a container. Did they switch over to containers? Uh, you know, I don't know. I know that Snap has always used um, virtual machine technology. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Thank I you. don't know the specific te not technology they use, but you have to have uh, the Snap daemon running. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't realize that that was at the level of containers or virtual machines. I thought it was just like a CH root jail. Yeah, this is Bill yeah. Bogsted here. I yeah. have played around with Snap a little bit. And I 
my experience with it didn't really make me think it was what I would consider a container. There are the the mounted file systems, um, but it for my usage it it really wasn't as as separate as I normally think of uh, a, a container to be. Um, uh, I, I was thinking about this. I mean, you you started off, um, Jerry, by saying that this was going to be uh, uh, that this was be about um, package, um, uh, I guess distribution. I forget exactly what you said, but um, there, there's that whatever you said could cover a lot of things, all the way from um, Usenet um, Shar archives from <laughs> 20 years ago um, to. Uh, uh, the, the particular things that you mentioned, um, yeah. and, uh, just getting back to, uh, snap, um, one of the things and, and software distribution, one of the things that Ubuntu has started doing is transitioning what used to be Debian packages to snap packages in particular, I think Firefox is you, they don't even like distribute, uh, on a, de uh, a dev, um, package version of Firefox anymore. And there's more of that going on, um, and that's a that's a user level sort of application, which I can kind of understand um, wanting to do that. But um, the reason I started looking at Snap is because I was interested in um, Canonical's um, LXC LXD um, container system that looks a lot like a VM. Um, and one of the problems for me uh, was that the only way to distribute that software is as a snap. Um, and uh, I'm and people talking about other possible um, distribution methods. The thing that really bugged me about that is I thought of a container system as sort of a system level tool that I wanted to be stable and Snap wants to update things the moment a new version comes out. And I really didn't want all of my containers dependent on them working with some new version of the container system that yeah. had been randomly installed. So if anybody can comment on anything I said, I'd appreciate it. Well, I just want to add to that. I feel kind of weird with like, when I install a portable application, it, like if I go and download a flat pack and install it because there's no alternative and I, I choose to install it and I, I stick it where I want to stick it and I run it the way I want to run it. I feel like that application is like a guest on my system. It's not something that the system, like the system manager shouldn't know about it, shouldn't care about it and shouldn't be updating it for me. Like it's, it's a guest, it's a portable application. And the idea of saying, well, we're going to distribute Firefox through the system packet manager as a snap. That just feels weird to me. And like, it's, it, you're installing this guest application that isn't really integrated with the system. And there's all these, like they try to integrate it, but there are all these places where the integration, that the illusion breaks down. And Jerry was talking about the file system issue, like yep. depending on the, the package format you're using, uh, you might be running an application and, and like whole pieces of your file system are just missing and the user has no idea how to make them appear so that you can open a file. Yeah, I that was a problem that Jill had, and I gave her a solution that I don't know if it worked or not because she just went and put on the uh, system version of uh, the Deb version of uh, Thunderbird. <clears throat> because of that particular problem. So, uh, so I didn't, you know, get that. I don't, I, I'm not an, I'm a Fedora user and uh, Fedora hasn't yet gone to the same level that Ubuntu has in terms of snap. Although they're going there. Yeah, they will. Looks like they're going to a flat pack and, uh, Yep. That's their standard. Yeah, I'm a uh, Fedora Silverblue uh, user. So I've got mm -hmm. a an Atomic OS, and okay. I install almost all my apps as either flat packs or app images when I can't find the flat pack. 
um, I avoid using um, Snap uh, in part because I had problems with the way the uh, uh, having to run a, a daemon to run all of the apps. Uh, I, I, it's been a while since I looked at, at Snap, but uh, I decided never to touch it again. Uh, but uh, uh, app images, uh, Brendan, are kind of what you're uh, describing is you can throw those files anywhere on your file system you want. And uh, that's one of the downsides from my perspective. I like the fact that uh, um, flat packs are, have a designated location either for a given user or for the system. And uh, I like it because I'm working on putting together some Ansible automation so I can uh, run a single command and fully rebuild my system with uh, known versions of all of the applications and uh, uh, get it uh, uh, a full full precision provisioning stack. But then again, I, I'm a system administrator and engineer, so uh, I, I yeah. dig down into the weeds a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we had um, a while back, uh, we had Dick Miller, and he was talking about Photox. And uh, Mike Carnelson, who was the developer of Photox, was on. And Mike actually prefers to use AppImage. Uh, and he was not a fan of either Flatpak or Snap. He said they were too difficult for him as a developer to use. But, I mean, I can see the advantage to these three different packaging managers. And, uh, you know, eventually there will be a, there may be a Linux standard, but I doubt it. Now, the, the Linux standard is you can choose among these three popular things. Until there's four. The Linux standard is that you can build your own. Yeah. Well, I, the way I always pitch the Linux desktop to other people is, look, in Windows, if you want to replace the window manager, you don't like how it's behaving, It's you can't even replace it. And if you tweak it, you're, you're always fighting with the APIs changing. And in Linux, if you don't like the way the window manager is, you just download the source and edit it. Yeah. And th that has happened, and that's why you have several popular window managers. I don't know if anyone's kind of quantified this, but like, um, say, in, in you have like a, a theoretical situation where you have all so many packages um, that are snap packages, like all of the memory overhead for all of the virtual environments or uh, the, the the all the routes that all those apps are running on, like how much memory overhead is that? Just buy more memory. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, you're talking to a guy that uh, grew up on a 32 kilobyte of memory. And, and now a, a 200 megabyte package for a simple database editor is a reasonable thing now, since to, thanks to Electron. <clears throat> yep. I love Electron, but I, I wish it was smaller. <laughs> yep. I can't speak to your question regarding Snap, but as far as um, flat packs are concerned, there is the uh, runtime and SDK, uh, which is separate from the application. So if you have a whole bunch of applications that use the, the same SDK or, or runtime, uh, then uh, a lot of the uh, the files on disk are identical, and so uh, so flat pack can flat pack packages can depend on each other within the ecosystem. And if you've got GTK from flat pack, you've only got it once. Um, there, there's a little bit of um, separation between applications and runtimes. So uh, 
there's a, a set of different runtimes. There's the, the um, the free desktop, there's GNOME, there's KDE, and uh, each of those are uh, independently uh, released with, with new versions. Um, and so you choose the, uh, the runtime that you that most suits your, your application, and uh, um, you build your application against that, that particular runtime. Uh, many other people will be building against that same runtime. Uh, but it's not so much a, it's not like Docker where you can take uh, the, uh, somebody else's application and make that your runtime. There, there's a, a much more delineated stratification between just applications and just runtimes. So what you put together is either one or the other, but can't be used as, as the other type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the issue that they need to solve is that when you're running under Linux, you want the your application to be able to run with specific versions of uh, li different libraries. And as you get into things like GTK or uh, Qt and stuff like that, it can get uh, quite messy if you're trying to build on uh, Ubuntu versus Fedora versus all the Magia stuff, which is originally comes out of Mandrake Linux. Not only that, but uh, which version of those uh Desktops does your your application uh, require? Like I've got uh, flat packs that run on GNOME 40, 41, 42, <laughs> all yeah. running side by side because they're all in uh, flat packs depending on the uh, uh, the individual types of runtimes. Yeah, so I, I personally I don't see a lot of solution to the problem with with them. You know, they try to solve that problem, but um, again, you have the issue, you know, they're still determined on your specific runtime or your specific run uh, software. I have the same problem with uh, Python. Uh, with uh, TK Enter, that uh, you know we wanted to run on a, a number of different machines. You know, everybody in the group had his his own virtual machine, and uh, and, TK, and TK Enter. Uh, the TK Enter didn't run on a couple of them. And uh, I, I forget what my solution was at the time. I was actually system manager at the time for those systems. Speaking of Python, uh, a number of years ago, I was trying out uh, Jython, which is Python on the uh, Java runtime. And um, it seemed like it was getting kind of out of date. Uh, does anyone out there still maintaining that? If it's like uh, if they're exploring like Python three uh, and a living Python, I've been the last seen... stable release is two point seven according to Wikipedia, and that was uh, twenty twenty. But it sounds like uh, they haven't made the leap to Python three point spec yet. Last time I looked at it was probably like in back in 2014. I guess that's important. Right? If we want to add uh, Python packaging into the conversation, uh, I have a, a recommendation for uh, using a, a tool called uh, Pipex, uh, which will uh, set up a 
Python virtual environment uh, and uh, create some uh, uh, wrapper scripts in in, uh, in a directory that you assign so that you can isolate uh, different uh, Python packages with all of their appropriate uh, dependency dependency modules. Um, so does that handle that. does that handle C plugins for Python and targeting different CPU architectures? If your system has the appropriate uh, uh, build packages, uh, if if pip would would build it successfully, then pipx would work also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's pretty much how we on Red Hat did our the product that I was working on. Uh, it always ran in a virtual environment because uh, it was for an auto automated installs, and it would essentially set up a virtual environment for uh, Python, do pip installs of all the dependencies so that you're essentially in a uh, virtual system. And uh, that way, if the requirements for the particular job you're doing required a specific Python module, it would go out and get it using pip. We were going to set up our own uh, pip library. We never really got around it, but uh, you know we needed a little bit of performance. I'm setting a local version of the pip library would have um, saved us some time. And while we're talking, those, of, it's, those of you don't, those of you who don't know PIP, it's a, uh, it's an installer for Python modules. That is uh, outside of your Linux system. It'll run on Windows. It'll run on uh, Linux. And you can run it in, as a local user, or you can run it as a system admin, a super user. Strongly recommend against ever running it as a sysadmin, because if it uh, throws it into the system paths, then you're yep. in for a world of hurt. <laughs> yeah. One of the you know, strong arguments for, uh, for PipX, it has its own place and doesn't ever touch the normal paths unless you intentionally misconfigure it. I'm pretty sure PIP and Ubuntu have a, in, in the Ubuntu ecosystem, PIP will put system libraries in a different place than the apt package manager will put Python system libraries and one supersedes the other, but they're managed separately. I think that's the case, but uh, yeah, you, you don't install it system wide unless you are building a service for multiple users. If you're doing some activity for just you, you install pip libraries in your home folder or in the project folder. Exactly. Since we're kind of talking down at the uh, the command line rather than application level uh, right now, uh, got another uh, uh, product to to throw into the mix. Uh, um, the Linux port of uh, Homebrew. I've had some experience with that for installing uh, command line tools on a uh, Silverblue system, and it's a real headache for that no one to work, but I've been able to build uh, homebrew packages on a Fedora workstation and then just uh, rsync over the, the whole directory structure over to, to Silverblue, and, and that works pretty nicely. Uh, it's a, a neat way of getting the, the latest command line tools that uh, either are not updated in Fedora or uh, are simply not available in Fedora. So Homebrew is a repository of 
recipes for installing stuff in macOS, right? And That's how it originated, yes. So and they then, ported that system over to Linux. Then there was a fork called uh, uh, Linux Brew, and now they've merged back together. And so it's the uh, the same um, same website, uh, whether you're doing uh, homebrew for for Mac or homebrew for Linux. Yeah. So that's a whole other that's a whole other way to manage the concept of portable applications. You can take the source code from upstream and add a recipe to it and say, "This is how you compile it in our standard," and then you run that recipe and the software is installed. And some of uh, some of the the homebrew stuff is all, also pre-compiled, and you're just pulling down. I don't know if it's tar tarball or what, but uh, you don't always have to to compile your your homebrew stuff. I've never tried homebrew because I I only knew it was for Mac OS. Hey, doesn't Windows have a, a similar tool as well? It's like chocolatey, is that? Yeah, chocolatey is the system one, and it's also used inside of Visual Studio. And I think there's another one that's kind of, that one. There, there's something that's similarly built to chocolatey, and I'm not sure if it still exists anymore. But I think Microsoft blessed chocolatey and maybe even adopted the coders. And that's a uh, chocolatey is mostly binary packages installed to a particular folder structure standard, like pip, like apt. So, Bob, uh, you've had some experience with. Uh, some of those packages, package managers? Well, yeah, I, I am not a technically minded person or a developer like most of the people at the meeting tonight, but just from an end user point of view, I have used Ubuntu, I have used Fedora, I have shoehorned a derivative of Ubuntu onto a Chromebook. So I've used limited resources as well as full resources. And uh, as long as you have full resources, I don't think the extra code bloat seems to bother anything. Uh, the app images may be a bit slower to open than most uh, installed programs, but Flatpak and Snap seem to be reasonably quick. What I don't like about Snap is sometimes a Snap will be missing some plug-in features and there's no way to plug them in to that particular Snap. I find that that is a particular problem, uh, not so much with web browsers, you can still do extensions, but I, uh, it can be a problem, I think with Thunderbird, that uh, some aspects of it are a little more simplified. So uh, you can't just take a Thunderbird plugin and put that in your profile folder? Where's the profile folder in a snap? <laughs> well, I it's don't know. In snap? It's in snap D. And SnapD, unfortunately, has a lot of things mixed together, or at least they're, they're in there in forms that aren't at all like a profile. For example, if I had Clause Mail as an installed program, each one of the mail folders I could just copy, and I could copy it back because it behaves much like a Unix mailbox folder. But if it were a Snap or a Flatpak, uh-uh, that's going to be inside of SnapD or someplace else. It's going to be in that uh, that uh, file system, that special file system, that is maybe not containerized but secured. That was specifically Joel's problem, because you know all all of her and Dick's email history was all in um, the standard Thunderbird uh, dot Mozilla folder. And if you're a, a if you're a user who understands backing stuff up, and you've got to have it, and say I back up these places in my home folder, yep. if, if if the user interface isn't telling me, by the way, your data is not going to be there, that's pretty scary. Yeah, I uh, app image is all over the place. Some of them do things 
inside their own uh, little world, but many of them will just simply use your file system. So uh, it's a lot easier to do things that can alter the behavior of an app image in my experience with them, but they're still not as configurable as a traditional fully installed app, a native app, shall we say, that's part of your system. And of course, this brings up an issue of uh, one of the fundamental user man system administration differences I've seen between Android and Linux is that uh, in Android, a traditional Android app only really has permission for its own little world, it, its section of the user's home folder. And then there's also these like generic drop boxes for documents, photos, and whatever. And I can't remember if Android makes the user confirm, can will we allow access to documents? Uh, but anyway, an Android app has to say, I want to access documents. And if an Android app wants to store data without asking, it's, it goes in its own place, which no other program on the system can access. And I think that's great security-wise, keeping everything nicely sectioned off in, in separate containers. And it, it, there's a certain expectation for how the user is expected to, to manage all this stuff. Uh, whereas the way the Linux desktop has grown up, just like Windows, uh, you just, you've got a home folder. And if you're running a program as me, then everything in the home folder is open to that program. And you can't say, hold on, I want you to ask permission before you open my fo photos folder. Yeah, uh, the flip side of that is, say I want to restore something that got corrupted or deleted. And I, maybe it's some of my email. Yeah. That's very easy to do with Clause fully installed. Yeah, absolutely. But if it were Flatpak or Snap, well, a little bit less easy. So I haven't had any problems with uh, any flat packs using their normal places in the uh, in the home directory. Um, uh, I've got several programs that uh, that are installed with Flatpak that do, in fact, use what would be the uh, the traditional uh, path underneath the the home directory. So I, I haven't uh, haven't experienced that. But then I haven't done. Uh, um, any email clients uh, with uh, with a flat pack yet, uh, but it is easy enough to configure lockdowns, uh, custom lockdowns with a, a flat pack. So, like uh, for instance, uh, the I think it was the the, the Zoom flat pack had a, a wide open permission to the whole my home whole home directory, and I didn't like that, so I locked it down to just a uh, like my downloads or. or uh, a couple other uh, paths, uh, and I, uh, it's it's real easy to uh, enhance and override the, uh, the lockdown permissions for for flat packs. I don't have any experience with uh, with Snap, and I have not found similar capabilities in uh, in App Image. Yeah, I, what I was also getting at with profiles in Thunderbird or Firefox, I again, if you had corruption in a profile, you could always find the profile folder and you could just copy parts of it or the entirety over to the damaged uh, installation and it would very often restore the whole thing. I don't know whether that works well with Snap or how you would do it. Yeah, but the basic point is that Jill needed, very specifically needed to point the Thunderbird profile to their common user data because they generally have multiple. Live streaming is on. Yeah, Jill, you What were we saying about Joe? Yeah, the problem, as I mentioned, Jill's or Dick and Jill, you you need to refer them as one person, essentially, the way they work. <laughs> so Dick and Jill were saying, like, my profile is going to be here, and that's the way it's going to be. And yeah. the, the snap package is like, no, you can't do that. 
Yeah, which is the problem. And uh, and going to one of Dick's meetings is interesting. Dick has not yet learned how to properly use uh, Jitsi. <laughs> well, you know, we're not trying to have everybody screen share today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've done it a few times, and uh, I usually, when I screen share, I usually screen share a uh, Chrome tab. But when you're doing it the way they do, because they want to uh, do an application, so they want to share Thunderbird, they want to share Firefox, but they're running uh, out of Chromium, so it gets a little complex the way you're doing it. So, but they usually end up with the, uh, your infinite uh, images. <laughs> oh. Um, Kurt's asking a question here. Has anybody had any bad experiences with Alien? That's, uh, use, that's installing RPMs on a not RPM system, right? No, it's in his case, installing a Debs. Oh, it's the other way around. System. Installing yeah. a Deb package on an RPM system. Yeah. I, I used Red Hat for like three months a long, long time ago. So I, I've got nothing to say about that. I have nothing bad to say about it. I'm just an Ubuntu person now. Well, I, I think, you know, if we're going to talk, I, I don't have anything bad to say really about Ubuntu. Uh, I used Ubuntu back and uh, added install fest. I upgraded my laptop to Ubuntu and Ubuntu would not install and it locked up my laptop. <laughs> And uh, that particular version, I couldn't install on the laptop, so I ended up installing Fedora on it. And I've been on Fedora ever since. But I've always had Ubuntu and several other distributions set up in virtual machines. Uh, but I guess nobody on the call has installed a dead package in an RPM system and has any tale to tell about it. Yeah, I've never used Alien, so I've never had a need for it. Kurt, can you comment? It might not have a mic attached. Oh, no mic. You can do hand signals. Okay, he can type. While we're waiting for Kurt to type, I'll share one disadvantage that I've experienced with a flat pack. I've been uh, promoting it a lot on this call, but uh, uh, one area where I I've had issues with is installing a um, uh, a, a photo downloader, uh, 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 rapid photo downloader, I think is the name of it, uh, as a flat pack. Uh, when I use it as a, uh, as a flat pack, it doesn't properly get access to my uh, SD card reader. So I have to run it as a native application over on my uh, Fedora workstation system. Uh, otherwise, uh, I haven't yet figured out where the uh, container uh, security limitations uh, are locking me out of being able to uh, to get to the native hardware.
<laughs> yep. You know, it, one of the things you know, that got me, Kurt's last post got me uh, thinking. Uh, years ago, I was involved with standards. Uh, I was in the compiler group at DEC, and the uh, the True sixty four compiler group, and the problem was I we had to deal with standards, and the bad thing about standards is they're all a pain. Because you all have to do things and you have to meet certain standards. And of course, your standard testing programs can break too, which happened to me. Uh, but the uh, if you had a standard package manager across Linux, you know, that would solve uh, Kurt's problem. You know, get rid of dib all together and uh, use RPM. Yep. And now you've got more, now you've got even more standards added to the mix recently with um, Apple yep. M1 CPU and Raspberry Pi computers and a few other ARM computers yep. going out there. Uh, my coworkers have been saying, hey, you should try Lando for managing, creating and destroying web project environments. And uh, Lando is like, all the conversation about supporting ARM on Lando for the last couple of years has been like, what, ARM, huh? And then suddenly the last six months or so, like everyone is, oh, all these Apple people are going to want M1 CPU support, so we better get on this. So like you can see software and say, that software works on my operating system, but I can't install it on my computer because I can't figure out how to compile it because um, they, they, they don't support my CPU. <laughs> yeah. That's an issue. So it, it, there, there, there's always a, this give and take between standardizing on this is the platform, this is the spec, this is how things are going to be formatted. And then, and then a new practice comes along and we have to go outside of what the standard specified. And so just never mind the standard, we're going to do a new thing. Now you've got two standards and then you get four and then you get 20. Yeah. Well, of course, I have an electric car, and uh, electric car charging stations uh, are all different standards. But uh, it seems that the CCS standard is emerging in uh, CCS1 in the United States and CCS2 in Europe. China has their own. Japan has Shadmo. But, uh, Tesla just recently caved and just said they're going to support the U.S. standard in the United States. Yep. They, in Europe, they've been doing it in Europe. Yeah. Uh, most of the Teslas they build in Europe, or most of the testers they deliver in Europe, it was up until recently they were sending them from Shanghai, uh, have uh, CCS adapters directly in the cars. So... But I mean, it's nice. With it's nice with a Tesla, you go to a supercharger, and you just plug it in. And but uh, if you go to let's say a if you have let's say a CCS adapter, and you go to um, Electrify America, for instance. You've got to look at whether to go at a 150 kilowatt station or a 600 kilowatt station. And if you're a, a slower thing like a Volkswagen ID4, you know, you can plug in at a 600 kilowatt station, but you're only going to get 100 kilowatts. And then the poor Porsche driver who can do a fast charge at 600 kilowatts can't use it because your car is sitting there and not at a slower one. So it gets confusing. 
So you have to look at that for charging stations. And then there's plug and play. As I said, Tesla has plug and play. You plug it in and that's it. Does all the negotiation. You have an account. The account goes with a car. If you um, can find a Tesla station. I have a lot more Tesla stations than you have Electrify America or EVgo stations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got, I've actually got one within walking distance of here. But um, Tesla, one of the things that made me a believer in Tesla is uh, several years ago, I was in uh, Moab, Utah, and they had a Tesla supercharger station there in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you can essentially drive a Tesla to almost anywhere in the United States and Southern Canada and uh, not have a problem finding a supercharger station. And it will come right up on the map. And, but the other, the other electric cars have some of Tesla's capabilities, not all. But there's some good electric cars out there. And uh, I threw up a map the other day showing uh, a trip in a, uh, I think in a uh, Kia EV6 across the United States from uh, Boston to Los Angeles. And the map showed all the charging stations along the way. Now, one of the things Tesla can show very nicely right on the uh, nav system is uh, for any single Tesla charging station, it will show how many ports are available. You know, if you have an eight station uh, charging location, it'll show uh, four used and maybe four are available, something like that. Uh, and you, apparently from the reviews I've seen, Electrify America and EVgo, uh, are a little more spotty because usually there's uh, several plugs that just are unusable. And of course, in the West Coast and Tesla, they've been cutting the cables. <clears throat> in some cases, they're cutting the cables and it's definitely for copper. But there are some cases where they're cutting the cables not even, not even close to the beginning if they just what? cutting cutting the cables in the uh, charging stations. What, what what do you mean by cutting the cables? You mean reducing the number? No. Vandalism. Vandalism. Oh, to steal the copper. Some people are doing it to steal the copper, but some aren't. Some are probably politically motivated. Oh, yeah. There was a couple of cases where. Cables were cut, and there were cameras at the uh, charging station. But they knew there were a couple of there were a couple of uh, stations that uh, were out of camera range, and these cables were cut somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they're going to steal the copper, you're going to get. You know, you're going to want to cut it to where you get the most copper. And so these weren't for copper. These were for political reasons. Wow. And there were a number of cases, especially in the South, where people would park their cars very specifically to block the charging stations. Hmm. 
it, is there recorded evidence or uh, like a calling card left behind or we just assume political reasons because there's no other motivation? We assume political reasons. I haven't seen anyone posting or anything on that particular news article that I read. Yeah, I'm, it, it probably is something political, either Musk or the, the electric cars yeah. versus something else. But yeah. uh, it, it, don't don't assume for like all the way unless somebody actually said that's why I did it. Yeah. So there. There's people in Manhattan that just walk up and down the street bashing car windows, and like you, there's one instance where this person was chased by a storekeeper, and they had video and everything, and they brought the guy, they followed the guy until the guy ran into cops, and then the guy got released the next day. Then they're never prosecuted, and then he was <laughs> back on the street doing it like two days later. Hmm. Yeah. And there, nobody can come up with any motivation for that other than just, I'll get away with it and it feels good. Yeah, there are some people that do that. <clears throat> I mean, I can imagine it as sort of a class resentment saying, oh, uh, here's these rich Yankees coming down with their expensive cars and I'm going to, and they're all, you know, progressive Democrats. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> so they get back at them. Maybe. Could could very well be. <clears throat> yeah, these, I think, the cord cuttings were, I think, in the Pacific Northwest, if I can remember. <clears throat> the uh, blocking of the charging stations uh, seemed to have been do uh, down in the Carolinas somewhere. And I don't know if these were just routine things or just basically just a couple of different uh, charging stations. You know, could also be uh, Hyundai users getting pissed off that Tesla, they can't charge a car at a Tesla mm, station. Yeah. All stories I heard about it, it was more more about promoting fossil fuels. Yeah. Please you say that again, Jabber? The, the cars blocking the uh, the chargers were not electric cars. They were like these big uh, yes smoke uh, smoke uh, we built the uh, large pickup trucks that like, spew huge clouds of uh, mm -hmm. yeah. That's another thing. It's uh, not Question. called steam rolling, smoke rolling, or something like that. Which uh, the the cars that are blocking the chargers are they occupied or are they left alone? I don't remember. I don't know because that, was... that's that's really asking. Like if if you block mm -hmm. a business function like that, you're just asking to get random yep. vandalism done against your vehicle. Mm -hmm. like, yep. and, and I could I could easily see somebody see a park truck like that slash the tires and run off because oh, I want to charge here and you blocked me. I certainly agree with that. Well, that, that's probably part of what they want. They want to be the victim so they can uh, look <laughs> fellow, they can uh, post and try to simply on social media. Yeah, well, if you own one of these uh, charging station areas, the simplest thing is just to get everybody towed, but it's costly. Yeah it, yeah, it takes time and it's costly, and and you're, it, it's like uh, playing whack-a-mole in an arcade game. Yeah, uh, there was recently a news item about Tesla uploading their uh, some of their uh, software, their uh, Linux. Tesla runs on Linux. If if you didn't know that. What package manager that I use? <laughs> <laughs> <I>, <and> Elon Deke. <laughs> I, but, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when Tesla has a recall, it's almost always fixed by a download. So you see, you see in the news, oh, there's 140,000 cars recalled at Tesla. 
Yeah, and it can all be done by a download. And when you're talking about the computer inside a Tesla, I assume you mean a network of computers where one machine yes. is driving the navigation, another machine is driving the engine. Yep. And they, they talk to each other over a network, but there's some separation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had... Uh, I had a case where I had a one gig. Let's see if I can get this up here. I had a one terabyte USB. And it's one of these uh, fake ones from Amazon. And I plugged it into my uh, USB connection. The USB connection in the for the USB A connection in the uh, Tesla glove is in the glove compartment for the dash cam, and I plugged it into the dash cam and closed the glove box, and that caused my Tesla screen to go blank. And you can't open the glove box because the glove box opens by a voice command, and so. That's dead, but you can still drive the car. You just, at this case, you don't have the uh, navigation or dashboard or something else. Everything else works fine, the brakes and stuff they're, like they're that. Still working. They're, they're still working out the threat models and the overrides, I guess. Yeah, I drove it, I drove it down to Watertown where there's a Tesla uh, repair station and they fix the car in about an hour. Yeah, All they that, had to do was open, open the glove box. That's, that's something that the user should have been able to do. Yeah, that's been taken some criticism that uh, in a Model Y, the uh, glove box, if you open by a, uh, by a soft button or by a voice command. <laughs> and there's no way to open it otherwise. So no manual overrides with these? With the glove box, yeah. <laughs> there is... Very there secure. Is, there Very is a secure. button. There is a button pack that you can get hmm. where you can plug it into the Tesla and you can program these buttons for a number of different functions, including opening the glove box. But there's no, there is no mechanical way for the glove box to open by the user rooms. Just a pain. You know, they they have to get it from the back. Well, and that, they may fix that, or they may have already fixed that in some of the newer model Ys. And don't forget, if Tesla doesn't like you, they can always lock you out of the entire car. Yeah, it seems to that, me to be very secure. That's <laughs> actually true. And, and what happens when somebody who, somebody else who doesn't like you takes over Tesla? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, almost all of your electric cars are going to be that way. That doesn't make it right. Nope. Uh, as one of my coworkers said, you know, it's software, it has bugs. Yeah, I, I can't talk very succinctly on the uh, hacking of Tesla. But, uh, but as, sure. as, we, as we learned from Musk in the last couple of weeks, there's always the hostile takeover. Yes, there is. And you're buying into whatever the future of that platform is when you, when you buy something like a Tesla. Yeah. But I love the car. I can park the car and then I can tell the car to come and uh, pick me up. Did you see that video of the Tesla that was called and uh, ran into a small plane in an airport? I didn't see that, but I, I know of that video. Yeah. Now, I've you actually used the smart summon a couple of times. I actually did it one time. Matter of fact, same restaurant I was at today for lunch. 
Um, and I was able to bring the car up to the front of the restaurant. It was in the winter. And the person parked next to me was very impressed with that. But uh, apparently they monkeyed with it lately, so it doesn't quite work as well. <clears throat> it can only work if you're in a parking lot. Or in one case, I was in a uh, park. I was in an actual park. And I had finished a walk, and I had summoned my car down to meet me. And it uh, took a while because it was, dirt, it was a dirt road and stuff like that. I love it. Yeah, I put it on. Uh, I'm only two minutes, like from uh, the Mass Pike or uh, US 90, uh, Interstate 90, and I put it in uh, autopilot on navigation by autopilot, and then uh, it can actually take the exits and get on to I 95 automatically. And from there, up through the three. Uh, I like it when it gets on from uh, I-95 to Route 3. But I usually take it off before it gets on to go from I-90 to one uh, I-95. Because the exits, I think it goes a little too fast in the exits. I'm not comfortable with it. You know, the guys I had lunch with, uh, they were, well, one guy was not a pilot, but they were all, you know, Vietnam friends of mine. And uh, three of them were pilots for deck. Or two of them were pilots for deck, not three of them. Was there any toolkits for, you know, tool for writing your own software for the Tesla? Do I have any what? Software any toolkits? Yeah. I, don't know what I don't know what you're talking about, Jabber. You want to write your own apps to run on your Tesla? Is there a toolkit for that? I don't know. I think there is. But they're pretty closed on that because uh, for the you're talking about the information computer, I assume. Yep. And they're going to be very protective of that because if somebody makes some information application for that computer that is too entertaining and distracting, who's on the hook for if it causes an accident? Yeah. One of the uh, recalls they had was uh, you could actually uh, watch YouTube or watch uh, videos while you're driving. And now you can't do that. That was a recall. Another recall they had. Uh, and was that like just push a few buttons, didn't need to install someone's special hack? No, it was just a standard download. <laughs> Tells you what's downloading and you can schedule the download to occur yeah, they, a different thing. The case law hasn't figured out who's responsible for what, and I imagine Tesla is going to be very protective of what you can put on there now. Yep. Uh, another thing that they turned off is uh, Tesla has a thing called Boombox, and they also have a uh, app called Emissions Control. And Emissions Control is uh, fart mode, <laughs> so you can I, make. I think I heard that. Yeah, you can make uh, each the seat farts. And the external move. loudspeaker, too, can't you? And the boombox. I have that. And then the um, they actually had to turn that off because the uh, it wasn't loud enough to 
when the Tesla was going slow enough because people need to hear the car. So that was one of their recalls. So the fart mode, external fart mode no longer works unless you've stopped. Since we've got off topic, I, I've got to plug this and I, I'm not, I have no relationship with the company, but um, I, if you want a, uh, if you miss your Blackberry and you want something that's new and up to date, I got a Unihertz Titan Pocket. It runs Android 10 or 11 and I love it. And there's a larger version of this that weighs a little bit more. Uh, they said that the one that's not Pocket is kind of, it's a lot to hold in if you're laying down in bed. So I got the slightly smaller one, but it's got a real chiclet keyboard and a touch screen and it runs Android. That's nice. Unihertz Titan is the name of the product. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and another thing about this phone is uh, if you're old and your eyes are very weak and I'm, I'm starting to th hit that threshold, you're going to want to get the larger version because this has a small 720 by 720 screen and the DPI control doesn't work very well. The browser that I use, it allows text to be too small and I haven't figured out how to fix that yet. Hmm. Don't get a Don't get a tiny 720 by 720 screen. I killed the conversation. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just responding to Kurt. No, I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm going to look it up later. <laughs> Sounds intriguing. Yeah, yeah they were in, um, oh, Seabrook. And they were associated with another company, and I, I bought some stuff off of them. Um, I actually met the owner at, while I was supercharging in Seabrook. You're talking about Unihertz or something else? No, Electrified Garage. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was actually a supercharger, and then the guy wanted to sell me a uh, backseat um, armrest and um, drink holders. But actually, he moved to Florida. He was Electrified Garage's uh, partner when they moved to Florida. But the people from Electrified Garage were actually Tesla employees. And they actually have a special relationship with Tesla. He works on DeLorean's. Uh, does he do hover conversions? <laughs> yeah, DeLorean is interesting. They These were some guys that started a business to repair DeLoreans and rebuild DeLoreans. And they're coming out with a new uh, DeLorean electric car. Hmm. Yeah. Is it going to break down every 20 miles? It depends how you uh, program it. Is this the shop in Texas? I, I know there's a big operation in Texas that is like all used DeLoreans and DeLorean parts. I don't know the name of it. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's uh, they actually have the DeLorean brand, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure if it's the same company. 
um, there was a on um, what's the name of the uh, TV show uh, Expedition X, and they had a thing on DeLoreans. They were tracking down the actual DeLoreans that were used in the movie Back to the Future and subsequent movies. And they wanted to actually track down the actual DeLoreans that are actually used in the movies. Did and, they find them? Uh, yes. Was the one guy, of them in, the, in the Smithsonian for a while? Or, no. Yeah, there's one in a museum. There's one in Massachusetts. Um, the one of the actors who played Dr. Brown, um, what was his name? Christopher Lloyd, the Klingon. Chris, yep. Yeah. He was actually what he was on that show, he traveled with them. And uh, Disney actually has one, I believe, or Universal has one, I don't remember. But the one that they had on display was actually a mock-up. But it was a pretty good, uh, it was a pretty good TV show. My sister ended up sitting next to Christopher Lloyd, the actor, on a long distance bus trip once, and she <laughs> said that he was very pleasant and fun to talk to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can tell you what Jerry Springer once did on a long distance bus trip. <laughs> was it something that belongs on the Jerry Springer show? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I just know what he was doing on it. Yeah, I haven't talked to Jerry in a few years. Oh, you know him? Yeah, he's my fraternity brother. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, he was once a mayor of Cincinnati. And, uh, now that we had a speaker at the BLU one time, uh, I forget what it was on, and the speaker's name was Chip Ock, who was from Cincinnati. And I went to high school with his father. You know, I went after DT. His father was also from Cincinnati. No, but I lived with Jerry for four years or three years in the paternity house. And I uh, dated his uh, girlfriend after they broke up. Because at the time she was our fraternity sweetheart and uh, wanted her to date someone in the paternity. Is Bob sleeping on camera? Is what? <laughs> Is Bob sleeping? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I can listen with my eyes closed. And That's fine. Quite frankly, it's been a long day and a long weekend. Yeah. Yeah, you said it was going to be. I hear what is being said. That's okay yeah. if you're not. I can blank my video if people find it distracting. Yeah. No, not at all. Well, you, we used to have fun with John. He used to go to sleep in the meetings. And uh, Blake Parker bought a uh, squirt gun. <laughs> we, you might have been there because those were the days when you were still in Boston, Brendan. Yeah, I, I do remember. I don't remember the squirt gun, but I remember people falling asleep. And yeah. probably I remember Jabber. Yeah. <clears throat> 
I, I had a professor who would always answer somebody's phone if the phone rang. Mm -hmm. yeah, I had some weird professors. I had one guy at uh, Boston University when I was working at Raytheon, BU taught courses at Raytheon. And this guy used to talk to the door, never address, <laughs> not, never talk to the students. And Interesting. Do you really miss Jim Morrison? Was that uh, because he had trouble focusing on people's faces or that it was distracting? I have no idea. I ran into him later. Uh, I took the uh, shuttle bus to deck one time when my car was broke down. I had my wife drop me off at a local area where they had a van, picked him up, and he was actually in the van. He was working. He was working for deck. Oh. By the way, if anybody's interested, the helicopter in the background is a H model Huey that actually flew in Vietnam with my company. And it's, uh, I can't, I don't have my logbook, but uh, that was one of the, belonged to my, uh, Platoon, and it's what I'm 100% sure that I flew that. Is it sitting next Huey. to a highway? Yeah, it's been restored. Is that adjacent to an airport, or it just happens to be sitting there in that spot? It's sitting there in that spot. I just picked it off my uh, company's uh, website. But they had it showing that uh, this was. One of the Hueys that uh, was restored that actually was part of our company in Vietnam. Those are known for being like really easy to fly, right? Have you ever flown a helicopter? No. Or is it the opposite? They're known for being really hard to fly. Well, how, if Hueys are a lot easier to fly than, let's say, a uh, some of the smaller helicopters. But uh, with a helicopter, you have five controls that you have to keep changing. You have the cyclic, which you hold in your right hand. You have the anti-torque rotors with your feet. And you have the collective in your left hand. And that makes the helicopter go up and down. And then at the end of that, you have a throttle. And yeah, I'll, I'll take an auto gyro, thanks. <laughs> yep, and they all work together. If you pull pitch, if you pull pitch, you have to uh, also give it a little pedal. Or if you add more throttle, you have to do more pedal and stuff like that. And of course, pedal operates the tail rotor, and again, it, that needs more power, so it's a the helicopter. It's a complete feedback loop, mm -hmm. and so one of the training things they do is after you've done some air work, while uh, the flight instructor lets you gives you the cyclic with that's one with your right hand, then the pedals, and then he gives you the uh, collective and everything goes to hell. <laughs> and you're, you're in a hover and your flight instructor then has a heart attack and lands here. But it, it gets, you have to develop muscle memory to fly a helicopter. It's a lot different. I had a, uh, 
I had about 200 hours in fixed wing training before I uh, went into helicopters. And it was just like learning from scratch. I knew I could do the air work because when you're at altitude, a helicopter flies pretty much like a regular airplane. But when you're in a hover, everything's much different. I imagine it's as complicated as learning to walk. And it usually takes people about a year and a half to learn how to walk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, uh, we had in the Army, we had uh, flight training was uh, eight months for officers, nine months for enlisted men. And the, uh, the first four months was with the small helicopters in uh, Texas. And that was just learning how to fly a helicopter, essentially. And then it, uh, then you go to Alabama at Fort Rucker, and uh, you go the bigger helicopters, the Hueys. And uh, the Hueys have, uh, you know, hydraulics, and they have. Uh, you can tighten your. Th you can trim them up a little bit. So are there any helicopters that are fly by computer now where you just give it commands instead of uh, yes. controlling all the controls individually? Yeah, they've been around for quite a while. But it's, uh, yeah, if you look at uh, the Coast Guard, they're flying uh, the H-60s, which are essentially... Uh, Blackhawks, and they're they've got a lot of automation in those aircraft. Mm -hmm. As long as, uh, but you still, when they do hoists and stuff like that, they really have to have pilots that know what they're doing. Sure. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've done an altitude hoist. You know, when you're hovering at 100 feet, you really, you can't see the person or the what's underneath you. Your crew chief actually has to give you directions. You have to hold it steady. You know, you don't want to swing the guy out. And I've done that a couple of times. And that's not easy to do. Player. What did you say? Especially hard on the fire. Well, in, at that point, we weren't on a fire, but we're in a combat area. Usually when the Hueys come under fire, we're usually down at ground level doing uh, insertions or exertions. That's, and of course we had one, uh, we had a couple of assaults where our own gunships were uh, shooting at us. Ooh. Well, the LZ was a rocky LZ and they were prepping the LZ and the Rockets were ricocheting back into the helicopters. Mm. And uh, we actually, one of our crew chiefs got wounded, minor wound, but uh, he was wounded on um, in that LZ. Yeah, combat assaults were things what they essentially they put white phosphorus the artillery would prep the LZ and the last round should be a white phosphorus and then you come in a few seconds after that and then your gunships would do some prep work before you go in 
And then you come in, you're clean when you go in because all the Charlies have got their heads down and stuff like that. Um, but the other way, taking them out, taking your troops out is more dangerous because you go into the LZ, the troops are running towards the helicopters. So their backs are to the any snipers you get. And, then, um, and that's when the snipers come out. We've had that happen to us when our gunships, <clears throat> we're faster than the gunships. And we went in to do the exertion before the gunships uh, showed up. And half of our aircraft got hit a few rounds. But none of us got shot down, none of us got hurt. So I think we're pretty much uh, pretty much done with the discussion on the uh, flat packs, app images, and snap. Any other comments? John, thank you for joining us. Feel free to join us again. Yeah, it was very interesting. I learned a lot of things about other things too tonight. Yeah. They're, they're, we have a question and answer period uh, at the start of the meeting. Uh, we generally start a formal speaker around quarter after seven and um, formal speaker will talk for an hour or two. Um, yeah. Uh, John, uh, are any thoughts about maybe getting Bob Frankston back? Or is he too boring? Yeah. Yeah, I guess we could bring him back uh, if he's available. If he's interested. Yeah, he usually is. Yeah, Bob Frankston is uh, one of the developers of uh, he, VisiCalc, which was the original spreadsheet program. I just learned the other day that VisiCalc, you actually had to trigger a re-render re of the screen, didn't you? It wasn't automatic. Uh, I don't remember. It was on an Apple II. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, the, the, it legitimized the Apple II. People would be going into the store and say, I want a VisiCalc machine. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't, you know, it, it wasn't as dynamic as the newer ones. Uh, I actually bought my first version of VisiCalc directly from um, Dan. If anybody wants to try VisiCalc, just go to the archive.org software library and search VisiCalc and it'll run an Apple II and VisiCalc in your browser. <laughs> okay. They've, they've got thousands of software packages with, set up with uh, in, in the browser emulators for whatever platform it is, and just ready to go, you push a button, it starts up. Yeah. Uh, Jerry and John, are, are, you, uh, uh, are you running drive for presentations? Are you looking for presenters? Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't have any ideas off the top of my head right now, but I'm always like, I, I present in situations like this a couple of times a year, and I've always got stuff on my mind, although I'm not kind of blank at the moment. But um, my home computer club, New York Amateur Computer Club, is really focused on amateur, and, and uh, there's a lot of stuff I would talk about that they don't want to hear. Uh, it, it, is there anything that, uh, any kind of topic you're looking for or uh, it, it, that I could do? I would welcome just about anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lately, yeah. I've been interested in process wire uh, content management system that is a good alternative to WordPress. And that's some, that's just one idea that comes to mind. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, a lot of people are interested in WordPress, especially if they maintain websites, mm -hmm. stuff like that. The one thing I wanted for a long time, and I've never had any luck getting it, 
I want to I want I want to get a good talk on IB about IPv6. Mm -hmm. We've had like uh, probably five or six presentations in the past where I specifically told them I wanted like a hands-on kind of thing. I, I don't <laughs> want an evangelist thing. I think this was brought up in the, the last meeting that I attended, and, and I somebody directed the question to me, and I'm like, well, I, I don't even have IPv6 at my home. Verizon didn't turn it on for some reason. So I'm not the one for that, for sure. Yeah, we did have years ago a guy from DEC who was on the IPv6 committee, and that was a long time ago. But um, the presenters we've had on IPv6 really have not been uh, very good. Mm -hmm. the, talk, the talk I was looking for is uh, I want to switch. I want to deploy IPv6. How do I do it? And that's yeah. what I asked for. And every presenter I, I asked when they came in, they said, "Here's why you want to go to uh, use IPv6. Now go yeah. figure out how to do it." <laughs> The entire industry kind of had that attitude. Yeah. But uh, I can email uh, John and Jerry, uh, like, in, in a couple of days, I can email, like, here's, like, five ideas that I have and what sounds like a good idea for the club, and you can get back to me. Okay. Yeah. We'd love to. Yeah, you've been a long-time member, Brendan, so. Mm -hmm. Well, am I a member if I if I, you you hadn't seen me for years and I live in New York City now? You've attended a meeting. You're a member. Okay. Especially you. You've, you've, you've actually been to the uh, brewery with us. Mm -hmm. Did I ever present at MIT? I don't remember you ever presenting. Yeah, I, I think probably not. No. Yeah, I usually remember. You know. But I heard the trick. I remember most of the people that used to come to the brewery at the after meeting meetings or some people that used to stand up and talk during the meetings. You know, that's how I know Paul Jameson. And then when I worked at uh, Raytheon that one time in uh, Bedford, yeah, I bumped into Paul there. <clears throat> I just checked the uh, the uh, calendar database. Uh, uh, no, Brandon, you're not in it. So I guess no. the uh, the work. And what was that? Did you say it's blank? <clears throat> Said your name's not in the uh, in the databases. Oh, I, I yeah. I, so you're saying yes? I never presented. That sounds right. No. I, around the time when I was still living in Boston, I did a presentation. I did probably two or three presentations in a couple of different. Uh, context before I moved to New York City about eight years ago. But uh, yeah, I, I'll think about what would be good topics and uh, I'll let you know and we can negotiate from there. Uh, okay, that'd be great. And if you're really hurting for June, I can do June otherwise, probably July. Probably best to get June filled uh, before it gets too close to the meeting date. So uh. yeah, well, I could do either. But if if anybody uh, sounds like June would work for them, you can put them in front of me. Okay. Yeah, somebody mentioned uh, Kurt mentioned Christoph. Yeah, Christoph Dorbeck used to do uh, Linux soup presentations here, and he originally worked for Fidelity and then uh, went over to Red Hat. And he still works for Red Hat. But he moved uh, down to Texas recently. He's from originally from Texas. Oh, and do you have any plans to move back into a classroom and continue the online meetings at the same time or no more online meetings? What, what's your I, strategy? That all depends on MIT. Yeah. yeah. It looks like uh, COVID is ramping back up a little bit, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't think MIT is going to open it up for user groups. In yeah, the that's pretty much the situation in, in the New York Amateur Computer Club. We use yeah. we used to use a classroom in N NYU, and yeah. the, the talk from them is basically you're not invited until further notice. And yeah. um, 
my, I have a plan for as the, the audio video guy, uh, my plan is to have a hybrid. I may have talked about this here in, in, in a uh, BLU meeting for have, have sort of a hybrid meeting where if we get back into a classroom, I'm going to say, OK, that we've got the speaker and we've got the audience and they can all informally talk to, directly to each other. And I'm going to live stream. Uh, I, collecting audio live and video streams is on. Oh, I thought it already started. I want to do a hybrid meeting set up with the yeah. uh, the presenter's computer and a camera and a lab mic all feeding into my internet computer and broadcasting that live on YouTube or whatever. And the audience can talk, the, the in-person audience can talk directly to the presenter. But I'll say that if you're remote and you want to say something, say it in the chat room and I will relay it to the presenter. And I'm, I'm figuring that's probably the best strategy because if you put a remote audience on a loudspeaker, it just kind of turns into pandemonium pretty quickly. Yeah, take a look. Yeah, take a look at um, some of the Zoom meetings that these courts are using. Mm -hmm. In Michigan, all the courts are now on Zoom, with uh, and they stream on YouTube. Yeah. And there's some very interesting judges. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, we, we don't have any start being invited back yeah. into NYU, and we yeah. don't have any other uh, alternative venues. Yeah. I have an uncle who's still a professor there. Mm -hmm. um, he actually retired. He was the longest tenured professor as it, when he retired. But I think he unretired. So he could keep, he was living in the uh, faculty housing and he had to kind of unretire to keep this faculty housing. So I actually had two uncles who were professors there. <clears throat> oh, and we didn't bug John the new guy. Do you have any presentation ideas? Not on your level. That could be anything. <laughs> What are you working on? Just you can share anything. Yeah, I'm I'm helping beginner Linux users in a national group. That's a story. And so, yeah, no pressure though. No. <laughs> yeah, we have um, a beginners user group. Uh, I mentioned Dick and Jill Miller. They do Jitsi also. I'll it's just... Oh, and, and Jerry and, and Jabber, um, this idea of I have to come up with a list of presentations and email them to you, that, that's the same task of for like a couple, for six months now, I've been saying, oh, I should write a blog post about that. Oh, I should write a blog post about that. <laughs> and I haven't actually written down the list of things that I need to write a blog post about. So the idea yeah. is like kind of come and go. And, I need to write them down and say, all right, I've got to write two of yeah. these this weekend. Yeah. yeah. I just went through that a couple of days ago. <clears throat> I was, I was <clears throat> asked to, go for, uh, to give a speech at my Toastmasters meeting. And um, I did that last night. So on, on Monday evening, I was like uh, racking my brain to come up with a topic. <laughs> Finally, I tried to, uh, I tried to uh, remember some stories from when I was a little kid. And I actually came up with a lot more than I thought I ever would have remembered from back then. For like the first seven years of my life. Probably write a blog post with each one of them. <laughs> well, if you need any help, with, if you need any help with uh, doing hybrid meetings, uh, I've been uh, running hybrid meetings for my Toastmaster Club since January. Mm -hmm. I've gotten pretty good at it. Well, right now, I pretty much have an approach, and there's a couple of pieces of hardware that I need that I have not bought. But it's kind of like, well, it if it goes another two or three years without me being allowed back in the classroom, I buy the hardware right now. So I I have the outline in my head, and when it gets closer, I'll prototype it at home. Yeah, I think the most important uh, thing you need to remember is that uh, well, really the, mo the most important component of, of it is the audio. If the yeah. audio sucks, the meaning is going to suck. Yep, absolutely. And I, I'm. Uh, 
I'm either going to have one or two mics, either a room mic on the camera at the back of the room and a lav mic on the presenter, or just a lav mic on the presenter and a compression. And uh, when the audience speaks, it'll be a little far away, but intelligible. And I, okay. I have that experience with a lav mic recording the audience uh, from the presenter's chest. And, and it, it, it works well enough if you're going to record a single channel. problem with that, having more than one mic in the same room, you're going to get feedback. Uh, yeah, you, you've got a, well, uh, only one sound source, like just the yeah. presenter's computer and no other sound source. But right. with multiple mics, uh, you need to choose one or the other and not both at the same time. Exactly. So it, 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 it's more load on the person running the broadcast machine if you're doing it live. Yeah. I use this little uh, electronics device. Uh, Only up right now, if you can see it. Uh, yeah. I can't tell because I can't see myself in the window. <laughs> Where was it? Uh, this has a uh, really excellent sound quality. It's a uh, P7200. What are you saying? Jabber, you muted. You're not going across. Yeah. Yes, you're good. John, you're muted too for whatever you said. I was just saying, no, he's not. He's still gone. <laughs> okay. Well, he's coming to us from Mars anyway. So we're going to close it up. Sure. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for letting me in. Not a problem. You're welcome anytime.